Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast. In this video presentation, in this episode, what I wanna do is to, I'm actually pulling out some pieces from some pre recent presentations I've given lately, talking about understanding sports injury from a dynamical systems approach. But I've talked about the ecological approach to understanding injury along, you know, the role of variability and preventing injury in a few different presentations. This is gonna be something slightly different. Uh, we're going to look more at, at, you know, acute injury and look at kind of kind of more into the dynamical systems approach in some way we can understand this. So here's what I'm trying to understand, right? This is, um, you know, how can we explain, you know, anyone who is a baseball fan will know that in recent weeks we've had a mass rash of elbow injuries in pitchers again. Pitchers that have had to shut down for the whole season and go through Tommy John surgery. But here's the question I'm interested in. How does an executing, so this is Lucas Giolito, who's Red Sox, who's had to go through a procedure like this. Um, he hurt his elbow throwing a pitch in the same way he has for millions of times, thousands of times before. Why does it cause an injury this one time he throws it, right? Spencer Strider, there's a whole bunch of different pitchers in Major League Baseball that this has happened to this year. Why does it cause an injury? One of the reasons that we have trouble understanding this is because most models of injury are very linear, right? They assume that it's a deterministic system, a system right? If we produce, if we have all the eight, we all the risk factors, you know, your age, whether you've been hurt before, how much you've thrown, how many innings you've pitched, right? How many, how often you've thrown, <coughs> um, the number of days between when you pitched, um, the time clock in baseball now. We can look at your mechanics and we can do, you know, and of course, incorporating variability in delivery is something I've tried to emphasize as a risk factor. And we could put all these in and these, you know, we could try to predict when an athlete is going to be hurt. The problem is, right, it, it doesn't work that way. All of these things interact in, in a, a complex system that is an athlete in completely unpredictable ways that we can never predict from one factor, right, that you're an older pitcher that you should get injury. You never think that because you pitch 250 in, in, innings, you should get injured. The shock, the pitch clock is decreasing, right? All these things are, of course, playing a, a role, but we can never predict directly which one is going to, when it's going to cause an injury and so on, right? So that's the problem with linear kind of models of injury and traditional models of injury. So what is a, a dynamical systems approach? Here's a, an example of a, a, a dynamical systems model of, of sports injury that considers the athlete as a, as a complex athlete, complex adaptive system. And this is a paper I took from, a uh, figure I took from Hamill paper in 2012, a very good paper that discusses this, a pretty uh, understandable paper. I'd have a, I would highly recommend it. The idea here is that, you know, we, your, your environment, you're in, you have different constraints. Right? You have the task of pitching a baseball, for example, the environment, the height of the mound, the field, the weather, the wind. Um, and within the task, you also have the pitch clock, how many, how often you, how much time you have between pitches, how many innings you're going to throw. You have your personal level of fatigue, right? All the traditional constraints. From this, a coordination solution is emerging, right? And this is causing, um, over time, you know, executing this um uh, this coordination solution causes micro injuries, right? It causes muscle wear down and tear and fatigue, right? Which in and of itself results in low um, uh, injury risk, low susceptibility injury risk. But the key factor here, what happens here is that over time, if we keep having the same constraints on the athlete and, you know, the personal constraints are going to change as they get more and more fatigued, um, we're going to have a change in the coordination, right? As the athlete, you know, we're complex adaptive systems trying to achieve a particular goal, right? We're going to fight to keep maintaining our goal, right? We're going to change our pattern of coordination uh, to keep throwing, for example, a pitch 96 miles an hour, right? And over time, what underlying this change in, in coordination, right, is eventually going to make us highly susceptible to an injury, right? One change in coordination we see, for example, is athletes incorporating smaller, less resilient muscle groups in the movement right, than they did before as they get fatigued and they get 
small micro injuries and, and slightly larger injuries. They're maintaining the same outcome by by incorporating these muscles. So this kind of redundancy and, and the redundancy in our system is actually dangerous here, right? Because it's creating um, creating this coordination pattern that makes us susceptible to injury. Right? So the idea here is that we have these coordination free uh, changes often result. Another kind of pattern you see is reducing the degrees of freedom in the movement. Um, and we get a uh, loss, we get these pain and micro injuries and eventually leading to some acute injury like tearing your elbow, right? And the question a lot of us are, can we track these? Could we actually detect an injury before it happens by detecting these changes in coordination? Right? That's what we're kind of looking. So what evidence is there that the loss of good variability, particularly in your chain, your coordination pattern, you know, we know that our coordination pattern has good and bad variability. What we want to develop in practice is good variability, right? The ability to maintain our goal using different movement solutions, right? Repetition without repetition, essentially. Um, complexity is a, a dynamical systems concept. We're essentially capturing the same thing. It's a measure of coordination, right? Are these a chain, is there evidence to suggest that these changes in these are precursor to injury? So the first of all, I want to look at the idea of a motor synergy, right? I've talked about this lots on the podcast before. Motor synergy is your muscles working, your muscle groups or degrees of freedom working together to compensate for each other, to maintain the task goal, right? So they're benefits, they're beneficial in terms of performance. I've said this many times now. They're also beneficial in terms of inner injury prevention, right? Um, here's a figure I really like, right? One of the ways you could think of um, performing repetition, correct technique, repetition through repetition. Right, repeatability, uh, performing the achieving the same outcome by using the same movement. It's like wearing a pair of high heel shoes, right? You're putting all these extreme forces in one small little area, the one solution that over time is going to wear out versus using repetition without repetition, having multiple ways to move to change the same goal, variability, you're distributing the forces over time, right? So that's the, one of the basic ideas. Um, motor synergy, just to remind you how we measure it, like imagine uh, the task, this is how I like to illustrate, imagine you have a task where you're pushing down on a force plate and you want to have the output, total output of your two hands to be 10 newtons, right? Uh, this creates a manifold of potential solutions. This is why we use the term manifold and uncontrolled manifold analysis, right? We could, we could achieve t you 10, a uh, total of 10 by having pushing really hard with one hand and not at all with the other um, or vice versa or using equal force in either hand or combinations. So this creates a manifold of potential solutions. Uncontrolled manifold analysis is taking, essentially having the person repeat that task over and over and over again and taking all the, ver the total variability of a, in the force in each hand and separating it into good and bad components, right? So a good, which probably should be called potentially good component, is any variability that stays along the manifold, right? So if a one trial, I have five Newtons in each hand, and then I go to seven in one and three in the other, I'm still maintaining my goal. That's good variability. That's movement along this manifold of possible solutions. We call it good because it has it gives you the ability to adapt to the conditions and tap to changes and constraints, right? For example, one hand getting tired. Bad variability is variability that's orthogonal, so it's often called ORD anything that takes you off the manifold. So if I go from five and five to six and six, and six Newtons in each hand, that's not good variation, right? Now I haven't achieved my goal. I put too much force in, right? So in uncontrolled manifold wellness, we can ascent, we can separate these two. And essentially we can get a measure of called the index of synergy, which is essentially the ratio of good to bad, uh, the difference between good and bad variability divided by the total variability. So it's essentially a measure of, of Bernstein's repetition without repetition, how well you can adapt you can adapt your movement solution to repeat the outcome, right? A high index of a synergy means you're very good at that, but you have a large amount of good variability relative to bad variability, okay? So that's this measure. Um, it's a measure of a motor synergy. Um, if we look at this, this, this index of synergy, and there's lots of different ways to measure it, we can see that it is sensitive to these kind of changes we want. Like, right, I, I talked about the injury that with increasing fatigue, this change in coordination. This is a study by Thomas Zoll on baseball pitchers. 
looking at uh, muscle synergy in the shoulder. This was using EMG, not uncontrolled manifold. But what, you, what they found was that over time with fatigue, you get changes in the muscle synergy, right? Um, changes with fatigue, more compensation from smaller, weaker supporting muscles as the pitcher gets fatigued. So again, a change in the pattern of coordination, which is maintaining the goal, but is potentially uh, leaving them susceptible to injury, right? Um, this is my work on hitting, right? Um, showing that you also get these adaptations in the synergies with training, right? This was um, the synergy I, I looked at was between the forward and backward weight shift when you hit a ball, right? The black dots are before training. Um, the the pink, uh, the black, the solid line, the pink area is the manifold, right? Before training, you have lots of variability, most of it taking you off the manifold. After training, you have mostly good variability. So these, we seem to get adaptations in these synergies with both fatigue, with, um, you know, there's also showing just through experience we get, and also through specific training interventions, right? Um, here's an example showing another study by Wombold and all, looking at, again, the, the, the motor muscle synergy in pitcher's shoulders, showing that the adaptations you get in the muscle synergy with over time with practice and pitching are different in their arm they pitch with than their other non-dominant arm. Right, which you'd expect, right? You're getting these functional adaptations. There's an increase in good variability over time. Okay, this is uh, so. I've done one kind of case. I've done a few case studies of this, looking at um, baseball pitchers. Right. So this is an example I did with a college pitcher. What we did was we looked at the index of synergy over time across sessions um, with a couple different other measures, like a performance outcome measure, their fastball velocity and the rate of previous exertion. What we found was kind of the pattern I was looking for, that index of synergy started to decrease, suggesting uh, changing the pattern of coordination, change, less good variability, well before we saw a reduction in the fastball velocity, right? So that's the idea here. In a dynamical system, you're going to get this overall change in coordination, the change in complexity of the system, well before you see it in the actual outcome performance outcomes, right? Because the system is a complex adaptive system that's adapting to maintain the performance outcome in a potentially unhealthy way. And before there's conscious awareness of this in terms of perceived exertion. Those, those ratings of perceived exertion didn't change until well after the index of synergy change, right? We also see this in a lot of other studies, right? This is, um, you know, there's lots of work on running, for example. This is um, Lipsick and colleagues from 2002. 2002, they looked at their variability in the stride length of runners, right? And what you see is a decrease in this variability before you get a report of pain, knee pain, right? Well before. So you can see the coordination changes before you get the, the actual performance and, and pain change. Um, say this is another measure in Hamelop, there's a, the variability in the running stride, the, the stance and the swing leg. There's quite a, a large amount of trial-to-trial -trial variability in the healthy running, right, in both the stance and the swing phase. Um, with PFP, patellar fem femoral pain, runner's knee, you get a decrease in this variability. Yeah, I talked about this in my book, right? Variability is healthy, right? Variability is healthy. Um, here, in, in it's a predict, this decrease in variability, this change in the coordination pattern happens before you get this. Here's a really interesting one. This is a really interesting paper I'd highly recommend. It's called Early Warning Signs Signals for Critical Transitions. It's showing how you can use a dynamical systems approach to predict when small changes are going to result in big outcomes, right? Um, right in both economy, in the economy, in history, in, um, in nat natural systems, and in injury. And this, um, this data they're showing here is the EEG that happens before the onset of a of a uh, epileptic seizure. Here they're measuring overall variability. So, you know, they, they, it's a different kind. We're not strictly focusing on good variability. And you can see this, you get a change in the variability before the actual epileptic seizures happen, right? So again, change in the coordinative structure that's going on, okay? Another example I really like is, is to look at what's something called the Hurst exponent and then something called critical slowing. So think about when you give a system, uh, what, what's a called a buy for give a system a, a disturbance, right? A buy something to kind of buy a, a perturbation. Shouldn't that should say perturbation, not bifurcation? Bifurcation is what happens off it. 
So a perturbation is when you, you disturb a system, right? So a uh, for example, a baseball pitcher, I make you go out and throw 150 pitches one night, 100 pitches one night. That is a perturbation, right? That is going to cause a change in the system, right? Temporary change in the way you throw, right? For example, if I asked you to throw an hour later, you wouldn't be very throw very hard, right? What this perturbation is called. But what the Hurst exponent measures is essentially the system's memory for that perturbation, right? Does the system get disturbed and bounce right back to where it was before, which is what you get when you have a strong attractor? That 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 would mean you know it has very little memory. Right, it it, it it essentially happened and it went right back. It doesn't remember what happened. Longer memory would be the perturbation. You could see the effects of it for several points after, which you would expect if you don't have a strong attractor. And you can measure this by this measure called the Hurst exponent, which measures the measures the memory in the system. Right. So this is showing um, that a stable system with no memory, right, has a deep attractor well. You knock the system out of the attractor well, it falls right back into it. It doesn't remember, it has essentially no memory of what happened before because it goes right back to where, where it started, right? And this results in a, a low, what's called an auto-correlation, where if you correlate across time samples, right, the time sample before the perturbation and after the perturbation should be relatively low. There's gonna be some correlation. A system with what we call this critical slowing or longer memory for the perturbation, a system with a re re uh, reduced re attractor well. And the idea, again, another coordination pattern that we expect to see change over time is to keep stressing the similar is the attractors are gonna get weaker and weaker, right? So the wells are gonna get less and less deep. I knock it out of the well, but right? it doesn't fall immediately back in because there's not these sharp, you know, sharp edges to the attractor well it's, it's it's a flat so it's going to take longer for it move back to where it was before it's going to remember essentially it's going to have memory for this perturbation you're going to get the stronger correlation and that's what the hearst exponent is measuring this correlation so i think these kind of coordination training are a really interesting way to look at injury history right so having dexterity what bernstein's dexterity which is the ability to adapt your movement solution to maintain the outcome in the face of changing constraints right, is healthy, right? It reduces the chance of injury by distributing the forces across different degrees of freedom. It makes for a more robust and resilient system. But the changes we see in the, this, these kind of, this kind of dexterity, the changes in muscle synergies, coordination, good variability, complexity, right? This is what we would expect to see before we get an injury, right? So injury is not, deterministically, it cannot be deterministically predicted by quote unquote risk factors, right? Age, injury history, number of pitches, so on. But it, can, it, it is going to be related to the kind of the changes in the core underlying coordination that occur, right? So I think this, I think this for me is a much better way to understand thinking that thinking of it, it's an adaptive system. The system is adapting to the what the perturbations you're putting through and how it adapts, whether it does it in a healthy or unhealthy way, is going to uh, increase the chance of injury in the future time. So that's kind of a kind of very quick look at a dynamical systems approach to understanding injury. Uh, thanks for joining me. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.